This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Ned Scott, of, uh, he's a co-founder and CEO of Steemit. Now, probably a lot of you guys have heard uh, of Steemit before. Steemit is a project that has, has realized the vision that we've actually seen a whole bunch of times on the show, at least realized it uh, to a bigger extent than those other projects, which is this idea that people can kind of generate con content and have this cryptocurrency that's used to reward uh, content creators. And Steemit's gotten uh, a lot of traction um, with uh, certainly more traction than any of these other platforms and it's gotten uh, also very high market cap at one point, which has since deflated quite a lot. Uh, and yeah, today we have uh, Ned on just to, to run us through what the vision is, um, how Steemit works and uh, how the project has developed. So thanks so much for joining us, Ned. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Cool. Well, let's, let's get right started. Can, can you tell us how did you become originally involved in the cryptocurrency blockchain space and, and how did that lead you to uh, to co-found Steemit? Uh, yeah, it was 2013, beginning of 2013. I recently graduated school where I was studying psychology and economics. really just loved uh, you know, the science behind behavior. And when I found Bitcoin, it just felt like the perfect match for me because the way I began to understand it is that there was this system uh, that was made possible and secured by people's motivations and incentives. I just fell in love with how that worked. It was like poetry to me. And I, I quickly asked Bitcoin to be my girlfriend. And I spent every night with her uh, thereafter. And um, I'm sure you guys have, you know, did something similar. Uh, but, you know, it was it was just something I was, I was in love with. And I dug my toes into every... Know, a piece of information about the technology and tried to meet as many people as I could and uh, quickly started thinking about you know what else is possible uh, technologically and I stumbled into a few projects I started looking at uh, counterparty when it came out and then I found BitShares. I found Dan Larimer who I ended up co-founding steam it with uh, also looked at ethereum and I've just followed you know, everything I can in the space and I've just tried to um, you know, just tried to you know, be doing it constantly. And um, I, I had another job. I, I went to work for a family, the Geller family, um, based uh, out of New York City. And that was great. And I was kind of balancing these things. And then um, halfway through last year, I approached Dan. I said, Dan, you built BitShares, which is this decentralized exchange technology. And it, it's, it's kind of in line with what a lot of the banks are looking for in New York, or at least the, what the consortia are selling people. You know, there's potential there with the um, the consensus mechanism that you've come up with uh, in delegated proof of stake and just with the technology in general, the idea that you have these, uh, this asset issuance, the idea that maybe you can have a pegged instrument on the blockchain. So, you know, I was, I was pretty proficient in, in all of it and I started bringing it to firms in New York and just drumming up interest. Meanwhile, you know, uh, talking with Dan saying, you know, let's figure out what the next mainstream application is. Um, and the conversation turned towards mutual aid societies which was really the, the concept of micro insurance and how can you bring together a group of people on this technology, this blockchain technology in such a way where they can pool capital and they can compensate people in cases of, in, in specific cases of loss and then make claims all through this blockchain. And it's the question of, can you make things more efficient? Can you um, provide services to a market uh, in, a, in a more efficient way or, or to a market that wasn't being served uh, prior? Uh, but as we were having these conversations, uh, we quickly realized that, you know, there would need to be a forum directly built into the blockchain, that all the conversation, all the claims uh, would need to be immutable and be tied to the account. And all the cryptocurrency aspects would need to be tied right in um, so that you could have auditability of claims. And once you're at that premise where you're talking about putting a forum on a blockchain, trying to figure out how that could be scalable and all that, uh, well, we quickly realized it was going to look like Reddit. And... Uh, things started to snowball and we're thinking, okay, we kind of have, you know, a social media platform on blockchain. 
and uh, just through some, um, you know, through some strokes of luck, we were able to come up with some algorithms that uh, reward people subjectively for participating in this cryptocurrency economy. And what that really means is that um, we came up with the concept of, of STEAM as a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization for rewarding content creation. So there's a special algorithm in there that rewards a set amount of tokens every day to people who are creating content and finding good content. And uh, that's one of the true innovations here, the idea that, that um, there can be content creation rewarded through a blockchain where you know people aren't paying uh, directly to read content or, or, or uh, access content. It's being paid in a socialized manner through this sort of fire hose of tokens and points. Um, so, you know, essentially, you know, I started a cryptocurrency, got into the 2.0 stuff, the exchange stuff, started thinking about insurance and then ended up in, in social media. And uh, here we are, you know, we, we kind of had the idea in January. Uh, we were able to string up uh, a blockchain based on other open source protocols, graphene, um, and uh, a lot of the tools that were developed in past projects. We were able to string up the blockchain by the end of March and get it launched via a, a public announcement on Bitcoin Talk. Uh, several stages later, the uh, Steemit.com had been released as the flagship um, interface into the Steam blockchain. And uh, then finally in July, the DAO kind of turned on and started actually rewarding people for content creation. And it's been a wild ride since we've seen a lot of uh, people come to the platform. There's been more than 100,000 accounts created. There's been more than 100 applications built on the Steam blockchain. So what that means is, is uh, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs and developers being uh, attracted to this system. And, um, you know, that's neat. And, and what it's forced us to do is, is really come up with a way for changing the way the internet works as a whole. And ultimately what I see Steam uh, becoming is, is a new content network for the internet that is censorship resistant and uh, you know, lacks sort of middlemen that can tell people what they can and can't do with this data. And, and that's powerful because if you look at institutions like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter uh, that are taking our time and our energy, creativity and attention and then monetizing that and turning it into profits for their shareholders, we can now flip that model and we can allow people to monetize their attention um, without uh, any sort of middleman and, and without people giving up the value for all the work that they're doing. There's been quite a few projects uh, in this space that have taken up some of those same ideas. I remember very early on, we did a podcast episode with Gems which was a, a sort of a WhatsApp type thing, but where it had the same kind of idea that, you know, you would reward people for uh, creating content. You might reward them for seeing ads. And then of course, let's talk Bitcoin as well with LTB coin. So it's, it, it, this idea has, has been coming again and again, or yours, uh, the yours network. We did a podcast with them a few months ago. Um, and it's it's interesting that uh, you guys have seen such traction. Do you have? Why do you think that is? Why have you guys seen uh, significant adoption? You know, if we're talking about gems or yours, you, you're, you're really talking about um, you're talking about tipping, and you're talking about uh, micropayments. And Steam is very different from that. It's the, the rewards in Steam are much more like Bitcoin mining, in the way that let's say there's a hundred new Bitcoin created a day for miners. You could say that there's a hundred new Steam created a day. To pay people who create posts, so really it's a it's a public competition uh, to you know get a post um, most upvoted by the community. And there's a special algorithm in there that, that distributes the steam according to how well a post uh, does on the blockchain in a given day. So it's this very new set of algorithms and token or or point issuance that makes this robust and makes it attractive. Beyond that, all the content. It's directly in the blockchain, which makes it completely censorship resistant, which means you cannot delete the data from the blockchain, which means, you know, people, uh, you know, if you think about Twitter or Reddit, where, you know, every so often there's, oh, they're, they're, they're censoring us or they deleted so-and-so's account. That, that really cannot happen in this system. Um, and I think that the other platforms you mentioned don't hit on either of those points. 
So let's talk about these algorithms. And I think uh, for, for most people that listen to this show, they have a pretty good understanding of how mining works, how proof of stake works, uh, you know, other consensus algorithms like proof of authority that we see in consortium style permission blockchains. Can you explain then how uh, the Steemit algorithm creates and distributes uh, tokens uh, for people who create content? So Steemit, Steemit.com is just one web interface, one web application that plugs into the Steam blockchain. And uh, the algorithms would be the, the Steam algorithms. And uh, essentially what they're doing is every day they're tallying all the posts and all the votes, all the stake that went into the votes uh, behind each of the posts. And then it's, it's basically mapping that to the entire rewards pool. So the rewards pool is just this, this set of tokens there that the blockchain is ready to distribute. And it just maps them together. And the posts that got the most stake weighted votes behind them receive the most rewards, receive the most steam. Uh, as as uh, as reward. So the rewards pool is something that is defined by the algorithm. Like so, is it similar to say in Bitcoin where you have a mining reward for each block? There is a reward pool that's defined by the algorithm that will get distributed. Yes, absolutely. In relation to the amount of say up upvotes or comments or some sort of set of parameters, uh, these these tokens will get distributed to the, those posts. There's essentially, there's the, the rules of the algorithm have defined sort of the supply of tokens. And, and, and that, you know, there's a digital scarcity. There's a predictable and set rate of tokens that can be created at any given day. Um, this year, there's 9.5% uh, inflation on Steam. And every year for about the next 20 years, that rate reduces by about 5, sorry, 0.5% until it gets to uh, a total effective inflation rate on Steam of 0.95%. And that uh, inflation is primarily being paid to the content producers. Uh, and then a portion of it is being paid to the witnesses who are part of the delegated proof of stake consensus and are securing the network. Uh, they're being paid to produce blocks and uh, are essentially you know, caretakers of the network who can be voted in or voted out at any given time. And when familiar with proof of stake, it's... Um, it's essentially uh, a system of elected block producers by the uh, by the steam holders, by the stakeholders. Okay, so let, let's get into the different components then. Um, perhaps a, a good place to start is who are the participants in Steam? And so you mentioned witnesses. Uh, I'd like you to go into details of what is their role. Um, we have obviously content uh, creators, content producers, content curators, and then perhaps even the different platforms that are plugging into the Steam database and acting as uh, sort of a window to this uh, sort of block explorer, I guess, if you wanted to compare it to Bitcoin, but one way, one interface to the blockchain. Describe all of the different participants and you know what specific roles they have within the entire network. Sure, yeah. So let's start with the people who are directly participating with the tokens and are maybe taking a uh, you know, piece of the, the new token creation every day. So yes, you have the witnesses, and the witnesses are block producers. Uh, they're responsible for you know, running full nodes, uh, making sure that all the data is replicated. These people are running nodes, or these groups of people are running nodes uh, that support all of the content uh, that is pushed to the blockchain. Um, so the content is replicated, it's uh, uncensorable because it's being run all around the world. And these people running these witness notes are being paid to do that. And the only way they're really uh, going to fulfill the job and get paid is if they are producing the entire set of data. Um, so that's like being, a, it's sort of like being a miner in Bitcoin, except uh, it's an elected position. Um, so there's there's the top 19 witnesses who are expected. So there's a round of block production. There's 21 slots of, of blocks in each round. And 19 people who are elected top witnesses are pretty much always producing. And they can be voted in and out, so it's fluid. But there's the top 19 positions always have one slot in that, um, in that queue of 21. And then there's another slot for proof-of-work miners. There's actually a, uh, a subset of proof-of-work in this system. So the miners are competing for that 20th slot. And then there's the backup witness slot. And there can be an infinite number of backup witnesses uh, who are being chosen for that slot, depending on how much stake weight is behind 
um, uh, their their position essentially. And so, the reoccurring rounds of block production. And um, so, why why is there a proof of work and proof of stake? Can you explain that? Yeah. So so. Uh, the governance and the consensus is, is relying on, on uh, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake. Um, and proof of work is, is a simple way for people to participate in the network uh, who are miners in other chains. They can uh, obtain tokens and can, um, you know, essentially participate that way. It's also a way to anonymously create an account name. You can mine an account name into existence. Uh, this way, no one has to, you know, if you, if you create an account through a web interface, uh, then you know someone has your IP, etc. Um, but through the, the mining process, you don't have to spend funds, uh, and you can do it anonymously. So so it serves that purpose. Um, so anyway, the, the next uh, position would be the um, the content author. So anyone can show up uh, to a web interface like Steam, which we'll talk about the interfaces in a second. But um, anyone can can show up and create content. They can push it through Steamit.com. They can push it through the CLI wallet. They can push it through. There's another site called busy.org. Um, and, you know, essentially it's like creating a post on any other social media site. And as you do that, then the community comes around. And if you, they have stuff you like, they upvote you. And then your post is subject to that rewards algorithm. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, you'll potentially be rewarded with Steam tokens and Steam points. And, um, and yeah, there's, there's lots of people doing that. I was just in Hong Kong. And out of the blue, uh, one of the top bloggers on the site said, oh, hey, I heard you're in Hong Kong. I'm in Hong Kong, too. And I met up with her and her mother, and we went out with dumplings and all that. And, I, you know, this is just, this was, it was if you think about the, the crypto world, this was a very unique interaction. Uh, this is, you know, someone who never would have been exposed to cryptocurrency before. Um, just some, you know, 22-year-old girl, um, you know, who, who's a travel blogger and, um, you know, about four months ago, she got involved with Steemit and has been doing really well on the platform, earning the Steam, you know, has become a cryptocurrency enthusiast from all this and has used Polo and you know, all these other tools that exist in the crypto industry. So it's been really special to see how many uh, different types of people have been attracted to cryptocurrency uh, through this platform. Um, there's another group of, of stakeholders in the system, and those are the voters. Uh, so if you hold Steam Power, the more Steam Power you hold, which is just the staking version of Steam, there's only one core token at the core at the center of this platform. There's there's Steam, and then there's this staking version of Steam, uh, which we're talking about the the, the curators. And um, if you are staking your Steam, you get more voting power, you get more influence over uh, how rewards are paid to uh, different content. Um, so that that's one of the uh, the value drivers is that people want to have influence over the network. And so they, they have Steam and then they power it up. Um, you can power up or stake your Steam instantly and you can uh, destake it over the course of 13 weeks. Um, so what that does is it, um, well, for one, it helps protect against the tax uh, for that rewards algorithm. And um, it also encourages people to be long-term holders. There's a tiny bit of interest uh, in terms of points that are paid to people who are staking. Um, so there's additional incentives uh, there to be a sort of long-term uh, participant. Um, but yeah, curators are, are essentially uh, competing to be uh, ahead of the curve, to be smarter than other people, to find posts that other people are going to upload. Because if you if you upload a post before the whole other side of the community uploads it, then you stand to earn more steam uh, from that vote. It's sort of like a prediction one. Yeah, so, so that's the authors, curators, witnesses. Uh, yeah, then there's the web interfaces. And actually, there's there's been 100 applications built on the Steam blockchain since July, more than 100 now. Um, there's new ones being built all the time. And, and some of them are quite uh, formidable, I would say, we, you know, are, are actually competitors to Steam it. But, you know, we actually implore that uh, because the more applications, the more social media websites that are built on this uh, blockchain, the faster the network can grow and the more robust and redundant uh, the system it becomes. Um, so another one is called busy.org. Uh, you can check that out. They're in alpha right now. Um, and there's tons of others that do statistics. You can go to steamtools.com and you can see this just massive list of, of applications. And I have a whole Slack room filled with more than 100 developers, uh, you know, people who are just interested in building things on this blockchain. 
So there's this whole contingency of developers and entrepreneurs who are looking to build, you know, the next competitor to discuss or the next competitor to WordPress. You know, ultimately, we see a, a, a path forward for turning Steam into the, uh, the content network for the entire Internet as a censorship-resistant system with no walls, no barriers to entry at all. You, t- you, know, you model a, an application on it, like Discuss, and now you can go to every network, like the Huffington Post, the New York Times, uh, WordPress blog after WordPress blog, and say, integrate this, this, this comments widget. Now, every time you have a post, link that post into Steam, and then use the comment section uh, derived from the Steam blockchain. And now you have access to this entire network of people. Um, and those people have the potential to earn rewards for commenting on your post. And you have the potential for this new revenue stream by linking your content to the Steam blockchain. So it's a win-win-win. Um, so that's the sort of thing we're looking forward to. Is I think today we have a proof of concept in Steemit and some of these other apps. But ultimately, the goals are very big to you know, provide a censorship-resistant layer uh, to the entire internet. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll pass it over to Ledger CTO, Nicolas Baca, who can tell you all about Ledger's security features and SDK. The Ledger Nano S is a personal security device based on a secure element, a screen and button, so that you can verify everything that is done on the device and make sure that you are really doing what you want it to do. Compared to our previous solution, this device is based on the latest generation secure element, the ST31 from STMicro. The ST31 is, an, is using a secure ARM core, which means that you can have the same ease of development that you would have on a generic uh, microcontroller, but benefit from the security features of a secure element. Security features uh, include an application firewall at the lowest level that lets you protect applications from each other which means that you can load multiple applications on the hardware wallet, even post-issuance. And you as a developer will be able to leverage these features to load your own application without our authorization and without any kind of authorization from the vendor. We will be providing this device with an open SDK um, that lets you do anything you want with this device. We provide sample applications for cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, uh, we will also provide a FIDO authenticator and you will be free to add everything you like. For example, you could add some secure messaging, some encrypted chat, and you'll see that the solution is quite powerful and very easy to develop with. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code Epicenter to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. So Steam, it's a very controversial project, right? There's been lots of lots of criticism, uh, lots of um, accusations of uh, you know wrongdoing, it being a scam and stuff. Uh, and of course, there's positions on both sides. But w- one of one one sort of area where there seems to be a lot of focus is on the the kind of the launch and, and how Steam it was created. So can you run us through? you know, when the launch was and, and what exactly happened then? Sure. You know, I, I, you hear a lot of these criticisms and some of it you have to expect in the crypto space where people have incentives in different places. Um, and what I've noticed is every single Bitcoin person or cryptocurrency person that I've spoken to or have come across and talked to about the platform ends up getting very, very excited about it. So my personal experience is people who have been um, you know, out, out, you know, wildly critical and outlandish in, in the way that they make their criticisms are usually, I don't know, it's, it's like they're upset because they didn't get a white glove invitation. And uh, that I find ridiculous. Other times you talk to people and it's like every other criticism they have contradicts what they said before. And it's very hypocritical. Uh, what we did is we were very careful about um, the way we launched the token so that it would be, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't violate uh, any regulations, laws in the United States where we're based, uh, we're very conscious of, of the issues with the different regulatory authorities around. So we were very careful to mine the token into existence and not hype it up, not make a big sale out of it. There was no sale. It just was software released on Bitcoin Talk. Uh, there was uh, essentially um, a test net that ran for a couple of days. People got exposure to that. Um, you know, people probably spent only a couple thousand dollars in total 
uh, sort of doing that. And then there was another uh, full net launched a couple uh, days later that um, uh, has become what Steam is today. Uh, but essentially, it was mined into existence over the course of a month, and people who so, read the code. So on 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 that one, you said there was a test net launch and then uh, sort of a full net launch. I was reading a little bit around there, and there were basically people saying that well, there was two. Well, there, there was a launch that was then aborted and sort of relaunched, but that wasn't communicated as a testnet or launch was yeah well we had to call it a testnet because ultimately there was a, a stack overflow and you know i wasn't actually participating in this and i think you guys know dan but dan's our cto and um you know he if he were here he could give you more details but i can tell you this that everything that happened in the code is completely audible you can go back to github and see exactly what was in the code you can see the exact bug um and Ultimately, what that did was it gave people two days of additional exposure into what this blockchain was capable of. Um, and ultimately, we spent thousands of dollars to you know, figure out how this thing could uh, you know, operate successfully and gave people more time and more education and insight into what it would become. Um, so, so honestly, you know, a lot of those criticisms okay. are just, I don't know, they seem ridiculous to me at this point. So, so you said Steemit was law, um, mined into existence. Over what time frame was that, and and what percentage of the um, you know the Steemits that exist today were mined in that time? Sure. So so Steam Steam Steemit is the Steemit is the website. Right, right. Steam. Steam Steam is both the blockchain and the uh, the native point system token. Um, so actually, the um, the software was announced at the very end of March. And then through the very end of uh, April, it was being mined. It was pure proof of work. And um, I would say that, that our company obtained uh, about half the token supply with the intent of growing the network and decentralizing the network over time, understanding that everything, most of the things that we caked into this thing were very experimental uh, and were expressed as such. And it was fully our intent and is our full intent today to decentralize this network and to grow it as best we can uh, to support the community. So those funds are uh, portioned out for doing exactly that. So you mentioned before this aspect of it being um, being locked up, um, right? When you have it to steam power, right? You get they get staked and then they get locked up for a certain time. And it's my understanding is that in the beginning this was 104 weeks and this was changed to 13 weeks. Is is that right? And what was the logic behind that? Uh, yeah. So when this thing started out, it was very experimental, and we had this this idea that it would be very uh, great for the social network to create a system that uh, supported long term holders because it was our experience that most of the people who get involved in cryptocurrency projects or crypto token projects want to support it for the long run if it's an innovative idea. And so we came up with a model that would essentially support that, where, where the Steam, the core token, wouldn't be uh, considered a currency at all because it, would be, it was being hyperinflated, but rather it was a door uh, where people could get into the system and then begin to stake and get voting power through that and get voting influence in the network. Um, ultimately, that ended up being uh, very, very experimental and not ideal in the community's eyes. And they've asked us, they had asked us and began to rally around the idea that uh, Steam should reflect more of the properties of some of the other uh, crypto tokens out there in terms of inflation rate. So it was uh, last week that a hard fork went through where all the witnesses upgraded actually well in advance. All the backup witnesses, the majority of the backup witnesses upgraded uh, to basically patch in a version of the software that took the inflation rate from being very high on Steam to being very low and narrowing over time. So that Steam can actually compete as a uh, viable currency. So this is something that happened last week only that it went from 104 weeks to 13. To 13. Weeks. To 13. So what that means yeah. is you, you can power it up and then you can begin powering down, and essentially each week you get an equal distribution uh, until it's uh, fully distributed back into Steam. For Steam power. Oh, so you get like a 13th of the. The coins back every week over thirteen weeks. Yes, and there's no hyperinflation at all, so you know people can be in either bucket, Steam or Steam Power. The issue the community had with the other one was that as soon as you move into Steam, it's like a hot potato or a melting ice cream. 
and you just kind of want to get rid of it. And we uh, understood that. You know, we, I think everyone learned a lot from uh, this experiment. It is an ongoing experiment. And ultimately, I think this is worth a conversation about what is the purpose of blockchain. We get asked a lot, you know, what is a blockchain? Why is what you guys are doing a blockchain? And ultimately, what it's really about is consensus and censorship resistance. And delegated proof of stake is a consensus model that actually acknowledges and embraces the idea of governance so that a blockchain can be a tool for supporting community interests. Um, and so that's exactly what happened here is the community's interest was in, uh, changing the model. And I think the community's interest is also in stability. Um, you know, this was a big change, but ultimately the community is going to find value in uh, being stable and uh, not having things change. Today's magic word is STEAM, S-T-E-E-M. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Coming back to the launch, you mentioned that it was mined into existence over the course of a, a month. Was that a sort of a linear uh way this happened so like a three percent of the supply per day or was that some different yeah it was uh probably very linear i actually don't uh mine so um can't say exactly what the algorithm was but it's all there on the blockchain and publicly auditable right because one of the criticism was that uh you know people give giving like wrong instructions so that people didn't nobody actually knew how to mine except the people who actually created the software themselves. So I'm, of course, curious, like, you know, what, what did it sort of have this uh, effect where you have this super quick mine in the beginning? Uh, if you had a linear mining over a month, then this might not make such a huge effect. If it's a few days only, the people created it can mine. But but if you don't know, then... Uh, Right, right. So, so the real purpose here is to make sure that the system comes into existence uh, in a way that will allow it to be viable and successful in the long run. And that's exactly what we executed on. And as far as the token being, uh, as, far, as far as the software being released, it's all there, absolutely public and auditable. People can read the code and figure out exactly what they want to do with it. But you don't remember how the mining actually took place in the beginning? No, no, of course. I, I was, you don't know. No, I was paying attention. I wasn't mining it myself. Is what I said. But you're the co-founder of this company, and you don't know how it happened. How what happened? How the mining, what the algorithm was for the mining. Like, how were those coins mined during the first month? They were mined over the was course. Was that a linear or sure, some sure, different way? Linear, sure. You can quote me on that. I didn't write the algorithm for the mining. With regards to, you mentioned the company has uh, mined about 50% of those coins. How much does the, were coins sold off and in what proportion and when? And how much does the company Very own today? Very slowly. We still have almost all of the tokens that we started with, and it's all dedicated to the advancement of the ecosystem. Actually, right now, uh, we're considering a nonprofit foundation. Uh, model for you know essentially moving the assets into something where they can be uh, publicly uh, demonstrated and promised uh, to be used in a certain way. We've already uh, made those um, uh, those assertions in many ways that uh, you know we are using these tokens to develop the ecosystem and as a potential uh, promotional sign-up tool um, to bring people to the platform uh, fully. Okay. So, so when you say very slowly they were sold off, can you give uh, numbers? Uh, yeah, we haven't sold uh, from that account into any exchanges directly, uh, only by a sort of shapeshift method and through other shapeshift type companies. So how much do you guys sell? Uh, we can go back and look on the blockchain, but it's probably a couple million steam. Yeah, I just wanted to ask whether you guys also mined personally, like you or Dan, or whether it was only the company that mined. Uh, I didn't mine personally. Um, everything that was mined um, by people here uh, would have been company property. 
So re regarding uh, the launch, uh, if we go back into those uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin, or sorry, if we go back to those Bitcoin talk uh, posts, uh, the person who was making those initial posts, uh, the reverse flash, uh, do we know who that person is? And does, does he have a role with uh, Steam at the company today? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. That's that's us. That's um, I mean, you can say that's the company. Okay, uh, but is, is that person identified as uh, like a member of, of the Steam team? Yes. Okay. Regarding rewarding content, uh, I'd like to go into detail about how content creators are rewarded. Uh, it, it, yeah, so could you explain when, when a content creator make, makes a post and posts to the website or through the CLI or through busy.com, please explain how the algorithm f figures out the content uh, reward because it's like it, when, when we're looking at it it's unclear there seems i mean perhaps sim simply because we don't really understand how it works um there's some things that seem inconsistent like we'll have posts with uh a lot of comments and a lot of upvotes but zero rewards while others obviously have rewards so can you go into detail about how that works yeah so so the algorithm this is where it's very different from uh, other platforms it's uh it uses state weighted voting uh, that is uh, used because uh, it prevents civil. And if you have civil attacks in a system like this where there's value on the line, then people can essentially just clean up and, and take more points just by creating more accounts. That's, a, that's an attack. Um, so it uses stake-weighted voting. And uh, what that means is the more steam power you have, the more influence you have over the rewards that posts uh, receive. So if something has a handful of votes, but a lot of steam power behind it, then maybe it's getting a larger uh, steam power reward at the end of the day. But if you have lots of votes and not so much steam power behind it, it may be getting less. Um, there's a few things you know we've think of, we've, we've thought about uh, tweaking here. Uh, there's one particular idea that I like a lot, which is the idea of curation guilds. Uh, where essentially people can pool their voting power and then share that voting power with people on the system uh, in a way that's more democratic. And that would be one way to increase the, uh, the fairness across the platform in terms of, and also just increase the wisdom of the crowd. Because the more people you have uh, voting on things, um, essentially the, 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 the more accurate you are in finding uh, good stuff or, or representing more of the community's interests. I mean, one could argue the opposite and say that people who have more stake have more financial interest in voting on things that uh, are essentially more valuable uh, to the community. Um, but I see it going the other way, and I think that curation guilds and making things more democratic could actually uh, be more valuable. You mentioned before that the inflation rate currently is 9.5%. So is this kind of the way it works as a steam, uh, the steam power... Uh, holders they upvote and downvote content and they then determine with those up and down votes how those 9.5 percent get allocated to content distributor yeah. that's 100 percent right now it's 75 percent of that 9.5 percent is what's being distributed to both the authors and the curators uh and the remainder is going to the yeah uh, but yes, it's essentially those upvotes that are determining where that inflation uh, is allocated towards. Because I also read something about there being an inflation uh, of steam that goes partially to steam power holders themselves. Sorry, yes. So it's, there's, there's a small interest rate, essentially. Um, it's 15% of the total inflation, so you could say 15% of the um uh, of the 9.5%, 9, 9 and then it's 10% that's paid to the witnesses. So 75% to the authors and curators, 15% uh, to the, the people who are staking, and then 10% to the witnesses who are producing it. Okay, so 75% of the new steam gets created, goes to the content producer, 10% to witnesses, and 15% to the stakeholders. Yes. Okay, no, so I, I, was, I was a bit unclear about how the... Um, the economics works. I mean, I feel like this is a, a generally a bit of a concern here for me. As I, you know, I tried to read the white paper a bit, and it is one of the most confusing and hardest to read white papers that I've ever seen, uh, and also long. 
So it's just, it seems a super complex system. Now, you know, maybe this is necessary, maybe not, you know, or, but it's, it's just, it makes it, it makes it hard to understand I think what exactly is going on. In the beginning, the, the um, objectives uh, were so uh, kind of experimental and there were so many uh, different hypotheses that we wanted to test. And ultimately, I think that we learned uh, more than we would have with a simpler system. But it's really uh, become clear to us now that this thing has sort of moved out of, uh, you know, being such a, you know, a less lesser known experiment into something that, you know, people are using every day. It's become clear that uh, simplicity is where there's much more value. The community is driving towards that and they're uh, requesting these features uh, over and over to simplify the system. For instance, now that, um, you know, there's no hyperinflation. Now that the staking period is much shorter, uh, there's not so much tension between those two parts of the system. And there's also, you know, because there's no hyperinflation, Steam is kind of like a lot of the other cryptocurrencies that are out there that, that don't have ridiculous inflation rates. So it's kind of a, you could call it a cryptocurrency. And the Steam dollar was this sort of complex mechanism that was created to um, essentially uh, give people a place to go instead of being in Steam and still have a currency. It was essentially it's Steam with a smart contract wrapped around it to peg it to the dollar. And so people didn't mind holding that, but ultimately it is a complexity in the system. It's a very cool complexity. There were a lot of things learned from that, you know, a socialized pegged instrument on the blockchain is, is pretty darn cool if we really dig into it. Um, and potentially has uses in other cases outside of a contract. But ultimately, with Steam sort of being closer to a currency, uh, or at least you know a token that, that doesn't have hyperinflation that could be used as a currency, there's less of a need for the Steam dollar. So, so we're kind of looking at it now and asking, you know, does the community want to continue to be paid out in Steam dollars, or do they want the system even more simple? Uh, ultimately, these things can be addressed uh, through software upgrades. If there's if there's a potential for simplifying, it can be done, um, and it's possible that that's what the community wants. So you, you mentioned earlier, and, and this is sort of the, you know, one of the major premises behind Steam, that um, it, it's a decentralized platform, that the content is decentralized, and that uh, there's, there's sort of this idea behind it that everyone is, um, you know, everyone gets to participate in this platform um, sort of at, at an equal, uh, as equals. Uh, and one one of the criticisms that has been addressed is the concentration of stake within a very small number of actors. And uh, since uh, these stakeholders uh, ultimately are the um, sort of voters that will uh, decide whether content does make it to the front page or not in the end, um, that concentration d does present itself as some sort of a a vulnerability within this, you know, this premise of everyone is equal and everyone um, has a chance to rise to the top. Uh, can you can you address that in a, in a, in, a, in a way that, um, well, I guess my question is like, who who are these people? Um, are they you know, members of the Steemit community that have risen to the top through sort of organic? Uh, means or are these mostly concentrated within so sort of the core members that were there at the beginning that were mining the coins or perhaps even Steemit um, employees? Sure. So so we talked about the, the Steemit uh, holding that's used to or it's sort of reserved and earmarked for uh, improving the ecosystem. And that is not voting. It doesn't vote. Um, it doesn't influence the content. Uh, there are some other accounts, for instance, there's an account that, that I control, uh, the one that Dan controls. There's accounts uh, held by uh, people who mine the coin early on that have a lot of these tokens. Uh, there are people who have come into the system and either earned or, I, I suppose, purchased uh, more tokens to get a bigger and bigger stake. We can point out those examples. Um, but ultimately, I think that uh, most people realize that Having a, a smaller group of people voting and influencing the content hurts the network because it becomes apparent that uh, the, the sort of algorithm for, for figuring out what rises to the top and gets rewarded is too, um, it's not a wisdom of the crowd 
It's not a function of, of the crowd at that point. And so that's why we talk about solutions like curation guilds. And actually, there have been some really innovative off-chain solutions where basically people have said, okay, uh, you know, guys, let's... So, so there's a new key structure system uh, here. There's, there's three types of keys. There's the owner key, the active key, and the posting key. The owner key essentially allows you to reset your passwords across all keys. The active key allows you to transfer funds. And the posting key allows you to post or vote uh, uh, content. It's, you know, it's, it's a transaction like anything else, but it's a specific type of transaction. Um, and so you kind of want to segregate it from your active key, just ultimately provides better security. So what can actually happen that's really cool is you can share your posting key with other people. And that's what's, what's happened. All of these whales have essentially shared their posting keys with people across the platform. People who are in the community chat rooms are now, you know, basically taking those posting keys and then other people are bringing in content and saying, hey, these are really good articles or these are really good articles about X, Y, Z. You could say they're about dog walking or they're about, uh, you know, making great soup or making, you know, uh, a, a, a trip to Everest or something like that. And, and then that group of people is, is deciding based on, you know, their uh, bylaws, so to speak, uh, what they think should be voted on that will help the community the most. So you have people outsourcing and basically giving away their voting authority uh, for the benefit of the community. So ultimately the voters uh, have become uh, many, many people uh, instead of uh, just being uh, the top holders of state. And what is the incentive for those people to whom the keys have been delegated to? Do, do they have some sort of an incentive to, to get those keys other than simply a monetary incentive? Well, one, they could want the influence um, and they could want to upvote specific posts to benefit the network. They could also want to be paid. I know that some of these curation guilds are paying some of these people to do the curation. Uh, it's essentially a job. Um, and so people who are concerned, if you took some early miner who's concerned about the content that's making it into the network, it's possibly in their best interest to make sure that there's good curation and that we, when people get to the site, it doesn't just look like Steam content or something like that, but is, it has attractive sub-communities and that sort of thing. So uh, when they outsource the posting key, they may also be outsourcing the economic rewards that come from voting. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J-A-X-X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for the support of Epicenter. I mean, it, it seems to me like this is a, a a good way to distribute the way that this content is being voted for, but it does it doesn't eliminate the issue of concentration of power because ultimately you have these very important stakeholders that get to decide um, who are their groups of people that they're going to trust uh, to curate good content, and so ultimately. Uh, it, it, it remains uh, the, the decision on whether, you know, content is good content or not. Well, it, it remains their decision. So, you know, if you have like say a hundred people that are, uh, you know, 1% of the, the stakeholders and they get to choose who their sort of content curators are, uh, they all, they also have the ability to withdraw their keys. Um, can, can you address that, uh, that problem? So, so let's boil it down. Are, are, you, are you suggesting that the problem is still um, suboptimal curation? I'm, in, I'm, I'm addressing the problem of centralization of power. So people have power proportion to the stake weight, but the stake weight has been basically determined, right, by uh, a short, a very short time where the whole thing was mined into existence, right, where people did not know about it. 
it was, uh, well, uh, according to at least many accounts, uh, done in a way that made it uh, very difficult, if not impossible, for most uh, outsiders to actually participate in this mining. So, you know, if the stakes are all coming from there, you know, that makes it whatever else you do afterwards uh, puts it on a dubious footing. A, dub a dubious yeah. footing. So, so it's kind of like if you, if you look at some other news network and they have an editor and they decide what gets posted, it's kind of like that, but better because it is distributed. It is in the hands of, of many people. Uh, can it be better? Yes, it's a sliding scale. Um, but in terms of you know people coming in early, there's, there's not an unfairness here. There's still an equal percentage opportunity to earn based on your stake weight. Uh, there's, there's a horizontal playing field in terms of percentage opportunity. Um, so I, I, I'm still, I, I still feel like maybe we're still abstracting to the, to the core problem. Well, I, I think that the problem goes, uh, I mean, it, to me, it sounds like if one looks at the steam, it, you know, then one can see, uh, first of all, a sound idea, right? Uh, it's the idea of, of monetizing content this way, of having a uh, decentralized kind of social network uh, or a news curation site. And, and I think those are all uh, sound ideas and, and you guys have obviously done some some real really good work there uh, and uh, I think especially where uh, Steemit has done great work is in the, in the user experience which is pretty nice right it feels a bit it feels quite a lot like reddit and you know of course reddit is um, has succeeded there and it's been a challenge for, I think for a lot of um, a lot of these projects to have good user experience because often, right, bringing in blockchain, bringing in cryptocurrency makes it much harder to, to have good user experience. So there as well, you guys did a good job. It's not totally clear to me to what extent there is a sort of centralization risk through the steamit.com website, you know, if that's kind of a like a sort of web wallet. Um, so maybe that's a question to ask as well. But it seems to me where this is more questionable is actually around that launch and how that happened and there is just reading about it it's quite it's very disturbing to be honest and uh to me it, it does certainly sound like from reading a variety of accounts on that that it was sort of structured in a way to ensure that you know you guys would hold a, a very large portion of the stake and, and of course if after everything Brian, it's, it's very clear. The company owns about 45% of the state. The employees here probably have 10% distributed amongst 14 or so people. Um, and after that, it's all in the community. And now you take that 50 or the 45% owned by the company. It's not being used in the system whatsoever. Um, so it's probably not as bad as people are making it out to be. Um, and it's completely dedicated towards getting better and decentralizing over time. Any object that comes into existence uh, is centralized at its birth moment and over time decentralizes. And we are at the very beginning of Steam and over time it will decentralize. So if there are issues with it today, uh, you know, decentralization is a subjective and, and sliding scale. Hopefully it gets to the point where Steam, it doesn't matter, or Dan and I don't matter and you know, that's could be years away. I don't know. But um, there's still a lot of growth to be had, a lot of development to be done. And it's fully in our objective to make sure that that happens. Okay, cool. So uh, another thing that, of course, Steemit, why it got a lot of attention was because the price went from, oh, you know, went from being totally unknown. It's a huge market cap of almost uh, $400 million, at least it sort of seemed to uh, be around there uh, on coin market cap, which I don't know, was that maybe number two even at the, well, number three, I guess, behind Ethereum, uh, behind Ether. And, and since then it's uh, collapsed quite dramatically. So it's now at about 10% of, of uh, its peak. What's your view on that? Do you have an explanation for those enormous fluctuations yeah i you know it's it's the the nature of of uh you know people finding out about a currency it happened after uh, the system kind of fully turned on and people actually being rewarded and using that 
you know, those tokens to go and pay their rent or buy a washing machine for their mother uh, and, and do real world things. And they're like, wow, all I had to do was blog to, you know, get a piece of this cryptocurrency. And, and confidence, I think, just went through the roof. And that led to whatever happened in the markets, whatever the speculators, um, you know, did is what happened. And you know, the interesting thing with cryptocurrencies is we've seen this happen before. We've even seen it in ha happen in Bitcoin from the end of 2013 uh, to, you know, six months later. You can pretty much overlap these charts dot for dot. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, that's not what matters to us. Uh, we're not focused on price. We don't care about what's going on in the market. What we care about is growth. We know that if we can build a mainstream application with 10 million unique visitors per day, that we probably already won. And that is what we're driving for. We're improving the user experience. We're you know, making it easier for people to sign up. We're solving all sorts of problems with crypto security and password management. Uh, for blockchain and cryptocurrency based systems uh, there's a lot of work to be done there and there's a lot of gamification to have, to do on steam and there's a lot of encouragement of third-party apps and making sure that there are viable business models for other applications uh, so you know the community is is asking for changes like revenue splits so that someone creates a post and they can say okay well i collaborated on this post with xyz people or this post was hosted on huffington post so the reward should be shared with the author and be shared with the platform, and be shared with the referrer, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so there's all sorts of, of things yet to be done, and that's what we're focused on. And, and if we do these things, if we grow, if we develop, everything will take care of itself, and whatever happens in the market is just what happens in the market. So before we wrap up, uh, I'd like to bring it back to the to the community that uh, that has gathered around Steam and the Steam website. Um, so give us your impressions on what has so I mean because as Brian mentioned earlier, we, we've seen these types of projects projects before, and none of which that has ha that have had as much traction as uh, as Steam. So what do you think, uh, from your perspective, uh, is unique about Steam? And has made it so that you know we have you know thousands of people today using this platform, and it's you know one of the larger one of the largest cryptocurrencies, and you know, it's certainly not the same size as Reddit or some other social network, but you know comparatively, it's it's uh, to other projects we've seen, it's it's quite successful. What what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's like I said before, it, it, there's a, a special uh, rewards designation here that that has not existed on any of these other platforms that you guys have have interviewed or, or seen, uh, it's completely new. It's the idea of a subjective proof of work where people can contribute to a community by developing projects or writing blog posts and then sharing that with the community and getting rewarded directly. It's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it takes a village kind of model and people are contributing in all sorts of ways. Uh, you know, whether that's by building tools or providing valuable information. And then the blockchain itself is designed to reward those contributions. Uh, through a subjective consensus that there was value there. So it's it's essentially subjective proof of work that is the new element here that's giving people a reason to get involved. And that is a, a big driver for, for, for the growth of the platform. So just uh, to end on that, um, so you now have uh, such a community that there have been events uh, being organized at Steamfest. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, Steamfest and what it is, uh, who comes there, what happens? Actually, I have a scarf from the event. Actually, it was in Amsterdam, and uh, the host made these Steam Fest. No, it was great. There were more than 200 people there, uh, you know, speakers from the blockchain industry, uh, prolific authors. Neil Strauss was there, author of the game, and, and Rolling Stone contributor, New York Times contributor. Uh, it was a really special event. And, Everyone I met there felt like family. You know, we've all been our, in our digital silos for the last six months, and you, you see people's usernames and, and, and handles and that sort of thing, and then you meet them in person, and it's it's really it's really special for that sort of thing to happen. I think a lot of good collaborations are going to come out of that, and hopefully more events. Uh, it's really um, productive to get together and, and, and talk with people about you know what the platform needs. And we went there completely ears open, asking people. What's your input into uh, what we should be doing with the website, with the blockchain? What do you want to see this thing turn into? And uh, you know, from that standpoint, it's great. 
Um, so yeah, so hopefully there'll be a steam fest too, uh, by some point next year and we can get even more people there. Okay, cool. Well, Ned, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Um, and, uh, we, we certainly look forward to seeing how both steam and steam, uh, develop, uh, and what comes out of this. I mean, there's no, there's no question that there's something there right in this space and that this is going to have a, a very big impact. I think, uh, the whole media curation coupled with uh, incentive mechanism and, uh, and cryptocurrency and, uh, and you guys have certainly done, uh, important work, I think in driving this cause forward. So I think it would be, it would be great to see where this all leads in the end. Thank you guys. I really appreciate you having us on. Uh, we're definitely looking forward to uh, coming on again soon. Cool. All right. Well, and with that, we are at the end of our show. So Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and other shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. And uh, if you like the show, then please uh, leave us an iTunes review. That helps new people find the show. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>